Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm going to look at the Tier 8 American Premium Light Fighter, the Lockheed P-80A Shooting Star. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the Lockheed P-80A Shooting Star, an aircraft noteworthy for two reasons. It was the first operational jet fighter of the United States Army Air Force and its replacement command, the United States Air Force, and also the first to have the engine in the fuselage, a design feature that became commonplace thereafter. Two pre-production models saw limited service uh, at the back end of World War II in the Italian theatre. The plane was used extensively in the Korean War, first in the air superiority role where it was found to be inferior because of its straight wing design to the swept wing MiG-15s, therefore it was replaced by the Sabre and transferred to fighter bomber duties. Within the game it's one of the oldest premiums, it was always a strong premium particularly with respect to its speed, not so much its agility and the guns benefited greatly from the buff to the 50 cals or 12.7mm machine guns as they're listed in the game in December 2021. In these days of highly manoeuvrable tanks, the P-61, this aircraft has to be built carefully in order to get the best out of it. What we're going to do next is look at the numbers for the plane. If you don't want to look at those, and I don't recommend that you skip the section, but if you'd want to, use a link in the description below to skip ahead to another part of the video. Here's the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 8 fighters. There are 16 of them, so you're sport for choice. They scroll off the end here, as you can see. If you don't know how this spreadsheet works, use the link below. There's an instructional video you can watch and that'll give you the uh, idea of what's going on here. So let's talk about gun armament and it's pretty good news straight away. Rating is 28, which isn't uh, even third best in class, but look at this cumulative DPS. That's 516, which is second best in class. It's only outgunned by the JL-1A37 Shenyang, the Chinese premium. And what we have are six machine guns. They're 50 cals, although the game calls them 12.7 millimeter machine guns, with a DPS of 86, a rate of fire of 1100, a range of 2079, which is useful on machine guns, it's often a lot less, a good auto aim angle of 4.2 degrees, that's the amount you can be off target by and the game will correct your aim, so you still hit your targets. Dispersion angle, pretty typical for machine guns, 0.8, that's the way the bullets spread out as they leave the muzzle of your gun. Of course, a good overheat time of 20 seconds and a reasonable shell velocity of 1093 feet per second. On the survivability, it's reasonably fragile. I'd say it's average tending towards poor, six, 360 hit points, damage resistance of 46. Fire resistance is a little low, although this is second best in class at 50. And this is something you're going to have to consider if you want to fit an uprated engine. Uh, don't be misled by the robustness of the XF-15C. That's a bit more like a heavy fighter than it is a, a, a light fighter with that survivability figure. But as you can see, even something like the TA-152 is more robust. This is not a strong plane. Airspeed, pretty good for what I would call usually a high energy fighter, but we'll come on to that later. 66. Cruise speed is second best in class at 311. However, the boost maximum speed is a little bit disappointing at 516. And as you can see, there are several aircraft here with higher rates. Uh, Horton 229, for instance. Bit of an outlier, the J8 M, probably not a fair comparison, but again, that Shenyang is coming in with a higher boost, uh, boost speed, and plenty of the other aircraft um, are similar speeds, and the Vampire will keep up with you if it's chasing you, at least for a short distance, so bear that in mind. You also need to watch out for the P51H as well, although the boost speed is not high, this is going to be a serious threat to you, and I would also advise you to keep an eye out for the ME209A. Maneuverability, pretty good for, again, an aircraft which in theory is a high energy fighter, 63. 10.8 degree uh, seconds to turn uh, full circle. Now here's a really important feature and useful, a 180 degree roll rate. And that means that if you are being pursued by something nominally more maneuverable than you, if you flick the aircraft and do a half turn and then flick the aircraft around again doing a half, another half turn. If the pilot behind you is not skilled or it's a bot, you may very well be able to shake it off. And that's emphasized by the fact that the controllability, this is the speed at which the control services will implement your instructions for a change of direction. 
um, is high at 85.4. Only a couple of the um, turn fighters, the Yak-15, and I think um, the Key-94 has got the same. Here's the one, Spitfire-14, have higher controllability rates. And importantly, you have much better controllability rates than most of the high energy fighters, which means that your maneuverability, which is already pretty good against those for the most part, um, is improved by the fact that your aircraft will respond more quickly when you want to turn it or send it up, um, up or down. Again, I'm going to warn you that the P-51H and the ME-209A are competitors in this area. You need to be very careful about trying to use maneuverability against these two planes. If they're not specialised, and yours is, yes. If they are specialised, and particularly if yours isn't, no. Altitude performance, so-so for a supposed high-energy fighter, 63. It's OK, but you can see the Horton 229, TA-152, particularly the J-810, which is an outlier here. Even the Shenyang is up there with you, so is the XF-15C, and again, I-250, the P-51H, the me 209 or serious threats to you can get above you with some ease. You'll be able to get above the turn fighters, and I recommend diving on those. Their exception there, of course, is the Ki-94-2, which has spectacular altitude performance for a turn fighter, and will be right up there with you. Power-to-weight ratio doesn't apply. This is a jet engine. The thrust in this limited comparison is so-so, 0.2841, uh, but you can see that the J8M is going to probably accelerate away from you easily. The JL1A37 will certainly accelerate as fast as you. If it's chasing you, that will be bad news. The Vampire, you might be able to accelerate away from. It depends on your build. If we go and look at the worst in class, and watch out for the Yak-15 I've just spotted, as I was about to leave this section. The Yak-15, if it gets on your tail, even though it's only got six seconds of boost, if the uh, pilot employs his boost, he's going to accelerate towards you. You're going to struggle to get away from that under speed as well. So be careful about how you attack a Yak-15. You want it in a low energy configuration for sure. And you want to be going at it quickly if you're going to take it on so you can get away from it quickly once you've delivered your attack. Worst in class figures, there's that survivability, damage resistance. The boost duration is okay at 8 seconds. It's not good. It's not bad. But that thrust to weight ratio, as you can see, is coming up as second worst in class. So you want to watch your acceleration. Now, we don't know how drag is implemented in the game. So it may be that the drag is so low that less compensates for um, the lack of acceleration in the aircraft. But that thrust to weight figure gave me pause for thought, particularly when selecting bonus characteristics on the equipment selections I made. You'll see that in uh, a section coming up in the video. So where does this place this aircraft? Well, it's awkward. It looks like a high energy fighter, and certainly you can build it like that. However, there is an aircraft in the game that is operating um, in the same sort of space as this aircraft. It's the P-61 Black Widow, which is highly manoeuvrable. There are two approaches, in my opinion, to coping with this threat, and you're going to probably find at least one of those in the game on the opposition team, uh, more often than not. You can try and outmaneuver it, in which case you're going to need a very specific build, and that's the one that I have employed. Or you can accept that probably it's going to be at least as maneuverable as you, if not more maneuverable, and you're going to employ a full speed build as far as you can. And I'll show you the effects of that as well. Warning, I think personally that if you do not use Elise Clark in this plane, the maneuverability build becomes far less attractive to you. So let's go and see how I built the aircraft. We're back with the P-80A uh, on the tarmac outside my hangar. My aircraft is specialised, that means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get this aircraft, because it's a premium aircraft, you won't be missing as many as you would off a tech tree aircraft, but you are missing one of the airframe slots for the equipment, and you're also missing the second uh, boot, uh, engine slot for the consumable. Shouldn't hamper you too much. Most premium aircraft fly pretty much the same um, stock as they do specialised. Let's go and pop mine into specialised configuration and we will see what I've done. Unsurprisingly, because these are machine guns and they tend to spray the bullets everywhere, we've got a gun sight here and we've opted for bonus characteristics of causing a fire, 10%. 10% extra chance of causing critical damage, and then 5% accuracy f um, when uh, firing at moving targets. In other words, an improvement in the auto-aim angle, 
which means that you can be off target a little more and the game will correct your aim for you and you will still hit it. Other possibilities here, you might go for 5% pilot resistance to injury, given how often pilots are injured, that's not a bad choice. You may go for pure accuracy improvement of 3% here, um, which would narrow the dispersion angle, and that's also a good thing to do on the machine guns, but I'm pretty happy with my selections here. And what we have here is a blended speed and maneuverability build, and you can do this because you've got four slots available across the airframe and the engine. And we'll talk about the alternative to this a little in a, a little while. Beware. This build, I think, is suitable for use with Elise Clark. And you will notice I've got Elise Clark pretty highly trained here. This is a crew trainer. If you decide to put a different pilot into this plane, not Elise Clark, I want you to watch what happens um, with the maneuverability figure. So we're going to take Elise Clark out. And we're going to put in my highly trained Sabre pilot. And despite being highly trained, the maneuverability figure has gone down to 72. And this is right in the zone where you start having trouble with most P61s, as opposed to maybe a very few P61s if you put Elise Clark in the plane. And if you're going to use this plane as a crew trainer, which after all is its intended purpose, or certainly one of its intended purposes, I would start inclining to the alternative build here which is taking out this lightweight power unit and putting in an uprated engine and I'll show you that in post build effects. However, for my purposes, I'm training Elise Clark. I want um, her in the plane and this maneuverability figure, which will go back up to 76, there it goes, is adequate for outturning almost all except the most extremely built P61s. With that said, we have the lightweight wing frame. Not fully calibrated, so bear in mind that you might be able to do a little bit better than me, but with extra adverse effects. And I've had in mind here, despite the fact that there are bonus characteristics for maneuverability, which I could pick off, and given my philosophy might be a sensible choice, I've decided to actually use the 3% wings resistance to critical damage, an extra 2% aircraft HP, and an extra 1% cruise speed, rather than those maneuverability characteristics. Now, if you are going to go all in on maneuverability you will pick the other three characteristics but when you get to the post build se section you can see why i was a little bit reluctant to do that we then have the polished skin which of course increases the speed we can just get the mouse centered cruise speed is up by six and a half percent again this is not fully calibrated in fact it's not calibrated at all 6.5 percent acceleration when diving there's an adverse effect on the, the maneuverability here, but I'm willing to live with that. Having said that, I've put on more acceleration here, 2% um, acceleration whilst diving, and then gone for the maneuverability characteristics. And this may strike you as a bit perverse, considering I went exactly the opposite route on the lightweight wing frame. What else could we do there? We could get another 3% acceleration when diving, uh, another 1% uh, cruise speed, and a 1% maximum speed with boost activated. None of these are bad choices. Uh, again, I'm happy with mine, um, but I wouldn't have been happy to see somebody else choosing uh, the other three characteristics, for instance. Then to increase the maneuverability even more, we have a lightweight power unit, uh, and the mouse is being misbehaving. And there we go. So another 6.5% your maneuverability, and another 2% 2.8% maneuverability in turns, and again this equipment is not calibrated at all, so you can do better. Bonus characteristics, acceleration without boost, 1% up, 1% cruise speed up, and 1% acceleration with boost. You can see a theme here, I've picked off acceleration characteristics, not only on this equipment, but also the polished skin, because I was wary of that rather poor um, thrust uh, uh, figure, uh, thrust ratio that I showed you in the pre preceding section. Other characteristics, you could go for half percent cruise speed, not necessary in my opinion, and if um, five percent engines resistance to damage, that's a good characteristic. If you are going all in on maneuverability, then it's the two percent your maneuverability at the bottom. And then for the other slot, instead of the uprated engine, which of course increases the fire risk, and that forces you down the route, in my opinion, of considering whether you need to use a fire extinguisher or possibly two pilot skills points on fire resistance and firefighter. We've gone for the high-speed gas type turbine, which carries no such penalty. 6.5% acceleration with boost activated, maximum speed with boost 3.7 up, and again, this is not calibrated, so you will be able to do better, but bear in mind that you'll be affecting how much boost you've got. We've got a minus 15% um, uh, adverse effect there. 
On the bonus characteristics, I've gone for a 10% uh, increased engine cooldown rate so I can get the engine back for boosting sooner. I've gone for 5% boost availability to offset that negative effect just above, and then 1% maximum speed with boost activated because I'm aware that the boost speed of this aircraft is a little bit low. What else have you got? Another 5% engine cooldown rate, acceleration with boost, 1% improvement, and then a half percent maximum speed with boost. And if I were to drop anything, I might drop the maximum speed with boost activated, sorry, the boost availability for the extra half percent uh, speed with boost activated. I prefer to um, uh, keep the boost for a little bit longer, but you might very well think differently and go for the two bonus characteristics there. Uh, giving uh, extra, extra speed under boost. We come to consumables. Because I haven't mounted the uprated engine, I've got still a fairly reasonable survivability figure. It's unaffected at 50, so I'm able to fit, without thinking about it, the first aid dressing kit, or first aid dressing package, which is important because pilots get shot out an awful lot these days. Um, pneumatic control assist for 10 seconds of extra maneuverability will be very useful in fighting perhaps a really extreme build P61 or indeed another P80A, that ME209A and the P51H that I mentioned. This might just make the difference. Engine cooling, unsurprising, an extra 10 seconds of boost provided you have at least one second available. And then because this aircraft does depend on speed, even though I've got the maneuverability build here, I've gone for the engine restart. Um, your alternative here would be the improved mixture control, one of these two here. Alternatives on the repair control services, you might go for control services repair given the maneuverability build. Yes, I prefer to have the extra maneuverability. I think the exhaust bleed inerting system is a is a, a serious choice if you mount an uprated engine. You should consider that. Mount gold ammun uh, sorry, mount universal ammunition. I do not recommend that you spend money on gold ammunition. However, if you have it available uh, or you are willing to spend the money, then uh, mount incendiary ammunition. Okay, so let's talk about pilot skills. Here we are with the pilot dialog box for the pilot. I strongly recommend that you use if you're going to adopt my approach of a maneuverability build, and that is Elise Clark. And Elise Clark comes with two special skills, one of which is fixed, one of which you can remove, although I don't recommend it. The fixed skill is the P-51D Master. This skill only applies to the P-51D and is irrelevant everywhere else. Is this an issue? I don't think so. I think a lot of people are using Elise Clark outside of the P-51D Master because of this second skill. Now this one is removable, but there's no point in removing it in my opinion. Um, to gain the extra two skill points. And that's because it increases maneuverability by 40% and it decreases the effect of damage on your control services by 25%. It stacks with the aerobatics expert skill because it has removed the eagle-eyed skill and not the aerobatics um, skill, which often an ex this maneuverability skill on other special pilots does. And of course the aerobatics e expert gives you an extra 2% maneuverability in all axes. So with this maneuverability build and using Elise Clark, I recommend that you get these three skills first. You've already got these, so that's fine. Work on the aerodynamics expert first and then get to the aerobatics expert as well, although the other way around wouldn't hurt. And then after that, you can work on this block of um, skills. Either one for you, I would go for Engine Guru 1 to try and improve the speed of the aircraft. You might just prefer the accuracy and go Marksman 1. Again, I would then try and work up to Engine Guru 2. Would I take off Marksman 1? I probably wouldn't. I'd probably just try and work my way up to Engine Guru 2, pick off odd skills on the way, and then reset when I could to get Engine Guru 2, and then similarly Marksman um, 1. And I think I'm going to run out, of, run out of skill points, so I don't think I'm ever going to get to Evasive Target. I haven't done the maths there, but I don't think I'll be able to have the skill points available for Evasive Target, but that would be an object of desire. If you don't put Elise Clark into this plane, then I think you probably ought to consider at least building it differently. You don't have to. But let's put in my XF-90 pilot and give you a flavour of what you would do if you went down the other route of going for a full speed build. And here, your approach would be slightly different. Now, you don't have the special skills that Elise Clark has got available. I'd still go aerodynamics expert first, and then I'd work on engine guru one, get engine, a Marksman 1 next, but then take it off and put on Engine Guru 2, and then work back to Marksman 1, and then, and only then, perhaps work up to Aerobatics Expert. Although I would strongly consider putting on Cruise Speed instead, 
uh, on a non maneuverability build, a speed build, and then possibly working my way up to resilience. And you will have enough skill points to do that because you haven't got the skill points consumed in the same way that you have on Elise Clark. Basically, you've got two less points to play with. Um, and four if you just choose to keep the maneuverability skill, which you probably will. So effectively, it's four points that you lose. So there's your two approaches for skills, uh, one for the maneuverability build and one for a pure speed build. Um, and I recommend the speed build is something that you would to, should use if you are not using Elise Clark in the plane, you're training other pilots in it, such as your Sabre pilot or other um, American fighter pilots. So I think it's time to take a look at the post build effects. And what I've done is I have the post build effects for the build plus Elise Clark, um, I've also taken off that lightweight power unit and put on an uprated engine, although I've kept Elise Clark in the plane. Let's go and have a look. Here we have a spreadsheet expressing the effects of my build choices on the base figures of the aircraft. And we've also got an alternative build here as well, where I replaced the lightweight power unit with uh, an uprated engine. Now, between now and the previous section of the video, I've changed my mind. For this build here, I've also changed the pilot and made it my Sabre pilot. Bear that in mind, I'll explain the differences um, as I come to this. The base figures for the aircraft, which you should have seen before if you watched the aircraft statistics section of the video, are in C and D. The effects of my build choices are in E and F. This is with Elise Clark as the pilot, of course. The difference in absolute terms is in column G, and the difference in percentage terms in, is in column H. The alternative build, with a different pilot, of course, uh, and an uprated engine, the effects are shown in columns I and J. The difference in absolute terms is expressed in column K and the difference in percentage terms is in column L. So let's go back to my uh, original build, figures in E and F, and what's happened. We've got an improvement in accuracy on the guns. That's it though. Um, the auto aim angle has gone up to 4.2 uh, degrees, which is an increase of 5%. So you can be off target by a little, little bit more and the game will correct your aim for you. We've managed to get the way the bullets spread out the dispersion angle down to 0.65 from 0.8. This is very healthy, a 19% increase. So the guns are going to handle better. Survivability has been slightly adversely affected. It's gone down um, by one point to eight. Specifically, we've lost nine hit points. Probably won't really uh, feel much difference from that. The damage resistance has gone down by two. This is tolerable as well. But for me on this build, the key thing is the fire resistance is unaffected and remains at 50. As a combined maneuverability speed build, you would expect an improvement on airspeed. It's gone up to 73 from 66, quite healthy, seven points. We've got the cruise speed up to 349, a 38 mile an hour increase. We've got the boost speed up to a much better 550 miles an hour. That's 34 miles an hour increase. Still not great, but it's certainly much better than the 516. And we've managed to limit the boost duration loss to 0.8 of a second. And that was by careful selection of bonus characteristics and not going for the full maneuverability build. Dive speed, of course, is unaffected. You'd also expect the maneuverability to be improved, and it is by quite a lot, 76, 13 points. We've got the turn time down to 9.5 seconds, or just above, 9.55. We've got the roll rate up to a spectacular 217 degrees per second. So you can really use that as a, an escape method from something that's pursuing, which has got an inferior roll rate. You might be able to throw them off target. We've also got the climb rate up to a healthy 563 feet per second, which means you're going to be able to get away from turn fire just trying to climb with you just that much more quickly, and that's important. Other effects, we've got an increase in the chance of fire and the chance of criticals, both 10%. Survivability, there are some adverse effects here, 4.5% wing damage resistance, that's worse. Worsened engine damage resistance by 12% and worse, worsened pilot injury resistance by 12%. On airspeed, Things that aren't listed in the UI, we've got a 10% engine cooldown rate improvement, so we'll be able to get back to boosting much more quickly. 8.5% acceleration with boost improvement, 4.5% acceleration without boost improvement, and an 8.5% acceleration in dive. And since one of the classic attack methods, particularly on um, aircraft below you, is diving on them, that's welcome. We've also got 13.3% improvement in your maneuverability, and this is all with the Lee's Clark, bear in mind. The second build, substitutes the uprated engine for the lightweight power unit. So we're going more for speed uh, and less for maneuverability here. And as a reminder, I have replaced the pilot with my Sabre pilot, which is highly trained. Specifically, it's got both engine guru skills. It also has a fire resistance skill. Also, 
we replaced one of the consumables. We took off the pneumatic controller system. We put on the exhaust bleed inerting system to try and cope with the effects of the uprated engine worsening the fire risk. Let's go and see what happened. Oh, incidentally, there's a gold equivalent to this consumable, and I'll explain the difference when we get to the relevant section. Guns haven't changed, so we've still got the accuracy improvements. Survivability, still down by a point. We've still lost nine hit points. We have managed to claw back one point of damage resistance. It's now up to 45, and here's the effect on fire resistance. It's down to 40, and this is getting very close to the territory where I would strongly consider mounting a fire extinguisher or possibly going for those both the fire resistance and fire um, fighter skills on the pilot. And bear in mind, in this case, I have actually got the fire resistance skill on the Sabre pilot. If you mount the gold equivalent of the consumable, um, the CO2 exhaust inerting system, this figure will go up to 44, which is useful, although it's going to cost you money to get there. Airspeed. Considerable improvement. 11 points on base, 77, 4 points on the... Um, previous build uh, which is a 16.7 percent increase we've now got the cruise speed up to 381 that's a full 70 miles an hour faster this thing is really going to whip through the air now and we've got the boost maximum speed up to a healthy 565 miles an hour um, which is nearly 50 miles an hour increase those of you who like your speed builds do not hesitate put this build on the aircraft even if you're going to use Elise Clark and I've limited the loss of boost still to that 0.8 of a second Maneuverability has still gone up. It's 67, which is four points up on the base. However, it's uh, down uh, by nine points on the maneuverability build that I have. Turn time, I calculate to be almost exactly 10 seconds. We've still got a very good um, improvement on the roll rate, 208, 209 um, degrees uh, per second. So the aircraft is still pretty maneuverable for a high energy fighter, however, you need to watch your P61s with this particular build, and I think you're going to have to use slash and burn techniques against many of them rather than try turning with them. Whereas with the other build, I think you'll be able to turn with all except the most extremely built of them. Altitude performance, we've got an improvement by one. Now the climb rate is 564, a negligible increase of one on the maneuverability build, but giving you all the benefit of being able to cl climb away from turn fighters. Still got the same... Uh, uh, extra chance of fire and criticals on the guns because we didn't change those. Survivability, we've now got 20% fire extinguishing speed and 20% fire damage tolerance. 4.5% wing damage resistance, that's an uh, adverse effect, the same as previous build and again, same as the previous build, we got the 12% pilot injury resistance uh, adverse effect. Airspeed, we've retained 10% engine cooldown rate, which is good. We've now got 14.1% acceleration with boost and 18.3% acceleration without boost. So the aircraft is just going to speed up that much more quickly. Maneuverability, we've got a negligible effect on the uh, yaw, 0.2%. Uh, just a reminder, in fitting the uprated engine, I felt that I needed to fit this exhaust bleed inerting system. There is the gold equivalent, which improves um, the effect of this uh, uh, consumable. And we're using this Sabre Pilot with both Engine Guru skills and also that extra fire resistance skill. So if you're going to use Elise Clark and try and outturn P61s, I recommend you go for this build, the one that I have and we're going to demonstrate in battle. If you're a speed freak, then go for this build with the uprated engine, but you'll have to compensate for it, I think, possibly with pilot skills and with this consumable. And with that, I think we ought to go and see how this aircraft performed in battle. map for the forthcoming battle is Alpine Gambit. It's the collision variant. It's a five sector map with the sectors laid out in a very squashed five spots of the die configuration. We have in the center the military base and this is strategically and tactically the most important sector on the map. Tactically it allows you easy access to the other sectors. Of course it fires those rocket strikes on ground targets in enemy sectors to try to flip them to your side. On one axis about the military base, um, with one near each spawn, is an airbase. This is a repair airbase. Probably not so important in this game because it's not central and it's only providing access to possibly the enemy garrison. Nevertheless, you can spawn there. You can get a new aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed or you can get full repairs. And then on the other axis, we have a pair of make weight garrisons, three resources every five seconds. And the way to win this map is generally to hold your mil the military base for longer than the enemy, 
maybe the entire game if you can manage that and your local air base and your local garrison given these things um, flip and flop about um, you might be holding the enemy air base or the enemy garrison and not your own at periods in the game if we look at the order of battle we can see that the enemy has an extra tier 8 we have two i have an unspecialized xf5u pancake a heavy for company and then i also have three tier sevens a yak 3rd which is highly mobile but on this map um, hard to see where you would have the best impact maybe the air base uh, an i220 which is not specialized neither of these are specialized i220 is a very good aircraft in the line um, could do work at the military base and then we have an il10 ground attacker which has less ordnance than um, the il8 if i remember correctly opposing us we have a highly maneuverable spitfire 14 an me262 which is not specialized and a top tier bomber a tu10 but also not specialized but already I'm beginning to see that uh, the enemy has better aircraft for taking and holding the military base than perhaps we do. And they have a pair of tier 7s, a Yak-3 highly mobile and a Q-93, but again not specialised. So on the face of it, we've got quite a challenge here. Let's go and see how the battle panned out. As we go into battle, let me explain that this is a natively recorded replay file. It's not one of the World of Warplanes team's files. Therefore, you'll see me looking around, you'll see me use sniper mode, and the reticle will be correctly aimed. We're straight off to the military base. This is the most important sector on this map, and I'm going to try and help my team capture it. And if we do, I expect to do most of my work around the military base in order to keep it for as long as possible. The entire game, if, if that turns out to be a possibility. So we've gained altitude and we're now looking for the ADAs. We'll also be looking for the enemy coming in behind. And there's the first one. I always like to know where the second one is before I attack. In this case, the configuration suits me, so I can go after this first a, uh, J4M. Begin to put the good DPS of this fighter to use, and that first ADA goes down. This is when we see a TU-10. This is the enemy human bomber, so we want this. He's got an engine down, so I'm easily going to be able to keep up with him. I may overshoot him. As it happens, I don't, and down he goes. This is a good start. I look at the fighter, the Spitfire. Decide I'm not going to go for that, because I'm going to gain altitude and try and take down the other bomber. And then I notice that the heavy is coming in, the ME262. Get a good bead on him, good shots as we go through. And now I've still got enough speed to keep up with him. He's not boosting away, he's trying to get the pancake. He's now lost his engine. He's in a whole world of trouble. Adjust the aim. Keep adjusting. Some slight adjustments allow me to take him down. And now we can go after this bomber. Always use your opportunities to try and take a look at the tactical situation, as I just did there. And that finishes off that bomber. So we've already disposed of four aircraft quickly, and we have the military base, which was my first objective. I spy the Yak-3 down below. It'd be nice to take him out. As I go down, I can then also address the ground attacker. Priorities here. Take the fight of the maneuverable aircraft first, then address the less maneuverable aircraft. He doesn't respond to me shooting him, so it's an easy kill. And that puts me straight onto the tail now of the bot IL-10M on the enemy team, and I shoot that down too. Look around to see if the other ground attacker is still about. It is. And I'm also looking around to see if I'm going to get addressed from the right-hand side, which is the side on which the enemy is spawning. So we start shooting the ground attacker. Try to avoid damaging the trees, because I like trees. Ground attacker is still just alive, and I get to finish him off. And I get a ram from the J4M. And that proves significant towards the end of the game. And we see the Spitfire. Looks as if he's AFK because he's flying straight. And when I shoot, he doesn't respond. And that's a shame for the enemy team. See a bomber up high. This is the bot bomber. Go for this again. And down he goes. And at this moment, my team is sitting pretty with four sectors to one. However, we know that on the EU server, four sectors to one early in the game means nothing. It will depend on whether the team defends, and quite often teams on the EU server simply do not defend any longer. Isle 10 is below me. Another quick look at the minimap. 
sorry, the map uh, with the order of battle was it's a better map to gauge what's going on. It shows more of the map than the mini map. Lots of good shots into that. See the heavy. It's a keen 93, the first time I've seen it. I assist in the destruction of that. The ground attacker was destroyed by a teammate. And now we have the ME329, which tries to shoot me and just manages to get a shot into my wing. He's now hitting me with his rear gunner. Was taken out my pilot. I have to heal him, and I finish off that ground attacker. Fighter came in behind me, and I could be in a bit of trouble here because I'm turning. And if this is one of the, the maneuverable fighters, and it is, it's the Yak 3, I'm going to need help here. As it happens, he's not gaining on me in the turn. Then he straightens up, and somebody finishes him off. But at that point, we lose the military base. Now the Spitfire is in. He doesn't pay attention to me shooting him, but clearly he's not AFK, so that last time I killed him is a bit odd. The ME262 happens to come at me fortuitously, fortuitously in that it wasn't shooting at me, and I'm able to finish him off again quickly. But this is all work being done when the sector is locked, as you can see at the top of the screen. So we've not made any progress to recapturing this important sector. So this is why I'm going to hang around, I'm going to recoup some of the lost health to that J4M ram, and then try and take out the uh, air defence aircraft. Rather similar to the start of the game. Start on that. Get a nice fire. Press the aim. And the lead. And that's the first one down. Akamatsu medal goes through. 400 capture points in a single sortie in a fighter. Chasing down the other J4M. Swing round. That's the beauty of this maneuverability build. It's so easy to get back onto the tail of ADAs. And other aircraft, of course. And this bot doesn't want to die. But we've got a fire on him and eventually he does go down. So we've still got some work to do here. The game is less than halfway through. So we do need this sector. Saw an alert on a ground attack, but he's a long way away. The team's taking out a ground target. A small value one. We need 40 points, but we're short of targets. And then finally, aircraft start coming into the sector. Unfortunately, we lose our filling, our bot, to AA fire, so now we've got more to do. We need to bear in mind that the ground attacker will probably try and shoot me, which it did. We've now lost the IL-10 to the AA as well, so we've now got lots to do here. But I'm on this ground attacker. Set him on fire. Break contact to get some separation so I can have a longer uh, pass at him. On my second pass, he's being attacked by a teammate, so he's on very low health. I get to finish him off. And we've taken so long to capture this sector, the ADAs have respawned, so I can go after them again. And just as they respawn, we finally do capture the sector. So now I'm free to go off and try and address uh, the other aircraft. It's all lying in 15 seconds or so. Anything I kill from now on will stay killed. And that will help us establish control of the battle. So I'm looking at the heavy, but I'm keeping aware also of the ground attacker and also the fighter in the background, which is probably the Yak, and indeed it is the Yak-3. I'm going to try and kill this first. And I do kill it, although we lose the sector at the same time. But it's one less enemy plane to worry about. The ME-262, not for the first time in this game, flies across me conveniently, and I track and chase him down. Down he goes, and that's the hero of the sky badge going through. Now the bomber is heading towards the centre. It's badly damaged. I'd like to take it out. And I get to do so. The winged legend goes through. Just avoid another ram, which would have been the end of my game. We take another sector. We're in good shape here. IL-10 is below me. I head down, I notice the other bomber. This is the human bomber. It's on nearly full health. Swing round. He's quick to get his gunner on me. Of course, this is where the ram comes in. As I begin to take him down to very low health, he's able just to finish me off before I can finish him off. However, he's not going to present much of a threat from here. And... Given the stage of the game, the point 645, and given that we're likely to flip the other sector, I probably am finished here.
Well, before I was able to respawn, my team killed the rest of the enemy aircraft, including that bomber. We have a Marseille, Akamatsu, Winged Legend, and Hero of the Sky. It's a nice battle. Let's take a look at the outcome of this battle, and as we can see from the centre, it's a 5 chevron battle, or a grade 1 fighter, and that grows 318,562 credits, with about 106,000 just over coming from a premium account bonus. If we look in the uh, message box, we can see that uh, there are repair costs of 4,700 credits for losing the aircraft once. No expenses for consumables. Those were bought in advance in a sale at half price, what I call prepaid consumables. Aircraft experience of 6,058. That's 3,336 base, 1,683 from the premium account bonus and other bonuses accounting for just over 1,000 there. 302 uh, free experience, 218 base, 84 coming from the premium account. No tokens on this occasion, but we can see here that we've got a Marseille medal, an Akamatsu, a Winged Legend, and of course the Hero of the Sky badge. On the personal score tab, we can see that two of the class specific missions were completed. That for destroying aircraft when defending was three fifths complete. That gives you 13 points, and that's a five chevron battle. Personal points of 15,825, two sectors captured. 18 aerial targets destroyed, 8,683 damage to those aerial targets, and 17 criticals coming off the machine guns. Lost the aircraft once, as I previously mentioned, and we had capture points of 560. That was 200 for defending, 360 for attacking. On the team score tab, we can see that would have been enough both by personal points and chevrons to be first place on both teams. Solid performances from most of my team here, some good scores. On the enemy team, not so much, but special shout out to the TU-10 who kept their, his team in the game with 13,525. And I think down tiered in a Yak-3 on that particular map, that's a pretty good effort as well. That brings me to the end of the review section for the Lockheed P-80A Shooting Star. And this premium aircraft is quick, nowadays has powerful guns, and can have the manoeuvrability built up so that it can compete with P61 Black Widows. Alternatively, you can ch you choose the traditional speed build and use slash and burn techniques instead. Well, I hope you found that helpful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. Stick around. There's a bonus battle, 20,000 personal points and an ace, but that's unnarrated, so this is where I leave you. So this is the Noble Q, signing out.